Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association. Making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Brianna Venozzi. A swift signature. Earlier today, President Biden signed the massive $1.9 trillion COVID-19 economic relief package into law. New Jersey's pot, more than $10 billion just for state and local governments. The Biden administration also doubling down on vaccines, purchasing twice the amount of Jersey-based Johnson & Johnson single-dose vaccine that originally promised. That's an extra 100 million doses. Between J&J, &J, Pfizer, and Moderna, it means the country will have ample supply to give shots to most of the U.S. population. Across New Jersey, more than 2.7 million vaccines have been given and more than 950,000 people have had either their second dose or received one of J&J's single shots. Increased vaccine rollout is one reason given by federal officials for relaxing guidelines allowing in-person nursing home visits. Families have been pleading for this, but the rules are confusing. Now advocates say state leaders need to answer just when and who can visit. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. I cried. I went crazy. I freaked out last night. I mean, we just buried her yesterday. Lisette Stirp and her sister buried their beloved mom, a former resident at Cranford Rehab. They got one compassionate care visit with the 96-year-old at the end of February, but requests for additional visits got denied as unnecessary. That's expected to soon change under new federal visitation guidelines unveiled late yesterday, but it comes too late for Lydia Amato, who died Saturday before her family could say goodbye. And the pain that I have in my heart that my mom died thinking, I don't know what she was thinking, but she may have thought that I didn't want to when I was there. I went on my front porch and I just screamed, saying, why, why now? Now we can't do it. It's the biggest pain in our heart. I hope nobody ever has to go through this. Cranford Rehab's director offered sympathy, noting we, of course, wish we could allow our families more visits to their loved ones during these trying times, but that the state currently restricts routine visitations and permits compassionate care visits only under very limited circumstances. That's why advocate Bill Borelli hopes Jersey quickly adopts the revised visitation guidelines. She tried everything to see her mother, everything. And the, and the fact that as we're hopefully nearing the end of this, her mother has passed, it's heartbreaking. Currently in New Jersey, a COVID outbreak can shut down visits at a long-term care facility for weeks. The new guidelines state visits can continue in unaffected wings if tests show the outbreak is confined to just one area. And they say compassionate care visits should be allowed at all times for any residents, vaccinated or not, regardless of outbreaks. This is essential because too much discretion, in my opinion, has been given to the long-term care facilities to determine how many visits, who gets to visit, who is who qualifies as an essential caregiver or as a compassionate caregiver. This basically says every resident has the right to have a visitor. The federal government cited rising vaccination rates as the reason for relaxing visitation rules, and New Jersey reports 72% of its long-term care residents have been immunized, but only about half the staff. Even before the feds released the revisions, Governor Murphy yesterday said long-term care facilities need to prioritize visits. We get that you want to be and need to be cautious. However, all long-term care facilities must take visitation allowances as seriously as they are taking virus control. No one should be prevented from visiting a loved one without a reasonable cause for health and safety. 
The revisions make other sweeping changes. They encourage nursing homes to permit indoor visits at all times and for all residents, regardless of whether people have been vaccinated. The few exceptions include when the residents got a COVID infection. Also, if they're not fully immunized and live in a facility where fewer than 70% of residents have gotten vaccinated and where the surrounding community shows high COVID infection rates, more than 10% of tests. Borelli wants clarity because there's so much inconsistency in implementation by the facilities. If they write it with clear language, then the families can serve as enforcers because it's sort of indisputable. An industry spokesman reacted. Right now, you know, we welcome um, everybody taking a look at opening up visitation. And we think as part of a reopening guidance and part of more people coming into the facilities, we would like to make sure that comes with a vaccination program. The state's reviewing the federal revisions. Lydia Amato's family will push for change. And I'm not going to give up. I want to help somebody else. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. In just over a week from today, our restaurants, bars, and other businesses will be able to welcome more customers inside, 50 percent capacity. The governor says the ease in restrictions comes as new cases and hospitalizations decline. Roughly 3,200 new positive tests reported today, another 46 deaths. But health experts warn as infections drop, so are our guards. More people are reporting getting lenient in their behaviors. Pandemic fatigue fully setting in as we enter the second year of this health crisis. Raven Santana reports on what could be a worrisome trend. Snow is finally melted, so we've been looking forward to this day for a long time. After being cooped up for months, like most of us, Jessica Taubman says it was a no-brainer to grab her two-year-old and head to Ponderosa Park in Scotch Plains to take advantage of the warm weather. It's definitely safer outside, so there's that. Instead of They've probably been hanging out indoors, so it's definitely better to get outside. Transmission risk is very low, much lower outside. The mom of two who has been fully vaccinated is also a family physician. Taubman says she's aware that the springtime temperatures could also encourage people to be more relaxed about social distancing. That's why she and Fanwood resident Jane Sapienza are still taking precaution. Well, if nobody else was here, I wouldn't. I mean, I don't wear the mask any more than I have to, but I, I do it if other people are around, if I can't social distance. Hi. Sapienza, who is also a grandma to 19-month-old Luke, says she will continue to wear a mask until she's told it's not required. This is crazy. This can't be forever, you know, but I do what I'm supposed to do. However, not everyone is as strict as Sapienza. According to the COVID States Project, which documents people's behaviors during the COVID-19 pandemic, the study indicates that as COVID-19 case numbers decreased in 2021, behaviors like going to work, going to the gym, or being in a room with people outside the home relaxed. Dr. Perry Halkidis, Dean of the Rutgers School of Public Health, says that lack of vigilance can slow down Jersey's progress to eventually having herd immunity. Hospitalizations are down, deaths are down, infection rates are down. These are all moving in the right direction. But it is often the case with human behavior that when you give people an inch, they take a mile. And so we are not out of the woods yet here. It is not like the pandemic has disappeared. The virus is still floating in our population. And as a result of that, we need to continue to be cautious. So with the warm weather and people wanting to venture out more, are, how are you preparing? So we're just slowly but surely kind of uh, ramping up for those things. It's, um, you know, we project having these additional tables put out front. We're going to get some new heaters put out here as well, um, just for when it does get chilly later in the evenings. But we're definitely expecting people to come out more and more as the weather warms up for sure. Joe Mortarulo is the general manager of Darby Road Public House, a restaurant and bar located in downtown Scotch Plains. Mortarulo says while he's happy to hear that the governor increased indoor capacity to 50 percent, he's been preparing for 100 percent. When you couple the occupancy and go to 25 percent and then have to socially distance things, there really doesn't change anything. We added you know, air purification systems to our place here. We had them installed as soon as things happened to try to be as compliant as possible. So I think over the next six months, you'll see a ramping up of, as I call it, consumer confidence that, you know, you'll still have people that may not want to go out for a while, but I think they'll be the minority of, of the population as compared to the majority. For now, Mortarulo says he'll take what he can get. But in the meantime, he's hoping the more people get vaccinated, the more they'll feel comfortable dining indoors again. 
For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. Well, early on in the pandemic, convalescent plasma was considered a potential game changer in the treatment of COVID-19. But since last spring, studies have shown mixed results on just how effective the treatment is. Now, a new study from Hackensack Meridian Health finds when there's a high enough level of antibodies in the blood, it's not only safe, but also highly effective at treating the coronavirus, especially when given early in the infection. What's more, it could protect against the rising variants. Dr. David Perlin is the chief scientific officer with the Hackensack Meridian Center for Discovery and Innovation and explains the findings. Dr. Perlin, it's great to talk to you. You know, we've had sort of mixed results with this convalescent plasma. What's different and new about having high antibodies here? Sure. So um, our approach to convalescent plasma therapy was to be able to maximize the, the amount of antibodies or neutralizing antibodies that we could use for therapy. So in our program, uh, in contrast to, for example, the national program, which has had a mixed results, uh, is that we qualify donors uh, on the ability to form very super high levels of antibodies. And that's only about 15% of our donor population. We qualify those antibodies by showing that they can actually um, directly neutralize virus. And then they're, uh, they're validated to be used for therapy. How effective is it? And we've been talking a lot, um, doctor, about these emerging variants and Sure. Um, just how contagious they are, um, the disease that they cause, does it also protect against those? So um, in principle, it does. Um, we, we, we have actually um, demonstrated, uh, not with patients, um, but, but uh, in, in, in laboratory setting, that the serum from patients who have a variance and recover mount neutralizing antibodies to those variants. Uh, and those neutralizing uh, antibodies are, are active against uh, local variants. They're, lo they're active against UK, Brazilian, uh, South African variants. So this, in, in, in principle, is an important therapy uh, for, for, those, for those individuals. And I, I will say that our program has been highly successful. So in the hospitalized population, we found that 89% of our patients are recovered following um, the application of, of the high titer serum. And that's, you know, that's a considerable benefit. Uh, and if you look at, um, we compared several thousand patients under the same conditions who didn't receive therapy on only about 70 or 71% uh, actually saw how we're, we're in successfully recovered. So there is a big benefit from, from the use of convalescent plasma, but we believe that you really need to be highly refined about how you use the therapy. Doctor, does it also potentially um, help people from being hospitalized? We're talking about folks who already have a, a severe case. Yeah, so that's the second phase of our study. So we have um, another uh, FDA approved study uh, to look at uh, roughly 300 uh, patients who are presenting with disease, who are not yet hospitalized, who we can then infuse with this high titer convalescent plasma therapy as, uh, as a way to prevent hospitalization. Like any disease state, and certainly any infectious disease, the earlier you can treat, um, the more effective the, uh, your, your therapy will be and the better the outcome. Dr. Perlin, uh, really good to talk to you today. Thanks so pleasure. much. Yeah, my pleasure. An update on two North Jersey school districts that have been in a bitter standoff over returning teachers to the classroom. In Montclair, the Board of Education and Local Teachers Union ended their legal battle over returning teachers for in-person learning. If the union approves the district's new safety measures and changes, students and teachers from kindergarten through fifth grade will return for a hybrid plan starting April 12th. It'll be the first time students step foot in a classroom in over a year. 
But in the South Orange Maplewood Public Schools, negotiations are going downhill after the district withdrew from the mediation process because the union downgraded the offer to return to classrooms Monday, limiting it to just K through second grades and want more medical accommodations added to the list for educators. 41 are currently granted. It's unclear when in-person instruction will resume for all 7,200 students in the district. Meantime, how much funding school districts receive is just one of many topics lawmakers will be tackling as they start public hearings on Governor Murphy's record $44.8 billion budget. There's plenty of new spending items proposed and an influx of cash expected from the federal government. But as our budget and finance reporter John Reitmeyer tells us, despite all that money, advocates say there's still a number of needs going unmet. John joins us with the latest. John, we're talking about record spending, nearly $45 billion, but what I'm hearing is that there are still folks who say those in need aren't getting enough aid. Yeah, it's it's really something. And, and every year, people come before lawmakers during these public hearings and raise concerns about different areas that maybe need more funding. And you know, the state has finite resources. Maybe lawmakers would want to fund it all in a perfect world, but there's a appetite for taxes that only goes so far in this state. And yet this year, I think with the pandemic, uh, you're seeing uh, maybe some of the same people that we've seen in past years, but they have different concerns that they're bringing to the attention of lawmakers and, and different issues that the pandemic has, has maybe exacerbated, things that have been there in the past, but maybe now uh, you know, because of the pandemic and, and some of the real uh, problems that many people are still having, uh, it's it's exposing even more need across the state in a lot of different areas. What are those priority areas, especially the new ones that have been brought by the health crisis? Yeah, I, I think for, you know, on the mental health uh, addiction, senior services, the developmentally disabled, a lot of the, the, the uh, services that in some cases the state even provides, you just think about how much harder it becomes to deliver those services when you have things like lockdowns and isolation and you know real concerns about uh, people still getting sick and yet a lot of these services still have to be delivered because the consequences for of not delivering them would also be pretty severe so it's a tough balancing act for sure uh, and even in you know a, a year where we're proposing record spending it just shows you the the needs out there across the community uh, that the state usually fills John, there were some calls from Republicans in particular to speed up the process, not wait until the June 30th deadline because this money is so needed to get into the hands of groups and people who need it. Does it seem like there's any indication lawmakers might heed that? You know, there are programs that are being funded right now and, and some of that uh, prior federal aid that's still going out. Uh, and there's new federal aid soon to be coming. So I think the, the conversation might change now that New Jersey's in, in line to get a significant amount of, of federal dollars once again, and, and maybe with more flexibility this time. Haven't heard too much about pushing things out immediately. There is a bill that would provide funding for small businesses right away, but we'll have to wait and see uh, as maybe some of this federal aid comes in to see if the timeline gets, gets moved up at all. All right, John, good to talk to you. Thanks so much. You're welcome. The latest unemployment numbers are out. Is this a one-off or could there be a change in the tide? Rhonda Schaffler has more details and tonight's top business stories. Rhonda. Brianna, unemployment numbers are heading in the right direction. For the first time since COVID-19 struck our state, new claims for unemployment dipped below 10,000. In the latest week, 9,800 new claims were filed, a 5% drop from the prior week. The new COVID-19 rescue package extends the additional $300 a week in unemployment benefits, which were set to expire this weekend. The state labor department says unemployed workers should transition seamlessly to these new extended benefits, which will now run through early September. As the legislation known as the American Rescue Plan rolls out, the New Jersey Society of CPAs says the IRS is expected to extend the April 15th tax filing deadline, and the group is calling on New Jersey lawmakers to follow suit as quickly as possible. And Jay's CPA says last year, the state extension wasn't finalized until April 13th, which it says caused chaos for New Jersey taxpayers and tax preparers. 
Businesses are getting ready for next week's change in indoor capacity limits now that Governor Murphy has upped the level to 50%. But executives in the restaurant industry say the change won't really make that much difference to their bottom lines. I spoke with Tim McLoon, the owner and managing partner of McLoon's family of restaurants in Monmouth County, and Bob Wagner, managing partner of Braddock's Tavern and Ott's restaurants in the Medford area. As long as you're at six feet and there's no bar business, um, we might be able to put a table or two here and there, but that's about it because the six foot distancing is what rules the day. They gave three foot social distancing to the schools. Um, so we, we asked for that, to, if that could happen, but they didn't give it to us and hopefully he'll, he'll give it to us. But 50% all that does for the people that are following the rules is just uh, consumer confidence that the world around us with the COVID is getting better. New capacity limits go into effect a week from tomorrow. Here now is a look at how stocks traded today. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. And this weekend, join Rhonda Schaffler for NJ Business Beat. She's putting the economic recovery in focus, exploring the pandemic's impact on our businesses as we approach one year since the state shut down. Watch it on our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. Finally tonight, we bring you a conversation with two women dedicating their time to shed light on some ugly parts of this state's history. It began when Elaine Bonk and Beverly Mills were plagued by questions about their own African-American lineage. What they found was New Jersey's brutal legacy of slave owners and labor. In fact, you may be surprised to know it was once known as the Slave State of the North. They've co-founded a Somerset County Museum and written a book in their quest to find the truth and unearth what many of our leaders tried to hide. Elaine Buck, Beverly Mills, thank you both so much for your time. You know, we do in the Northeast um, like to think of ourselves as having been a little more progressive, but in fact, New Jersey was the last state in the North to outlaw slavery, and you all have done a lot of work to preserve that history. Elaine, Talk to me about some of the places in New Jersey, especially Bergen County, that people might not think of um, as having ties. Well, um, our research has led us to find out that uh, almost all of the counties up in Bergen County um, were complicit in slavery. Um, I think of uh, Morris County and, and uh, Patterson and all, you know, all of the names of people, Carteret and Berkeley, all the names of the founding families that uh, were the people that started New Jersey and how they used enslaved people to work the land. Beverly, I mean, Black Americans we know founded this country, um, made the economy thrive, and yet there's not a ton of documentation of this. No, there's not a ton of documentation, unfortunately, and that's one of the, the biggest obstacles that we found when we were um, doing our research, preparing for our book. Um, then that's for a reason because that our records were not kept intentionally. Um, enslaved individuals did not have birth certificates issued to them. Um, they were listed along with um, household goods and um, whatever, even livestock. Um, so when you look for evidence of enslaved people within families, you can go into, sometimes you can, you can find something in a family Bible, but most of the time you find them in a ledger of uh, different people's, uh, their, their possessions. So it was, you were along with possessions with possessions. And we know yes. through your work, in fact, in your book, um, you highlight burial grounds um, that would have otherwise been plowed over, buildings put on top of. How difficult was it for you all to be able to preserve those? Beverly. Well, when we started this odyssey, as I call it, it's now, I can't believe it, it's, it's been close to 15 years. Um, 
we found out and through a phone call of someone that was really truly alarmed over the prospect of this, um, what he knew to be a, of a grave site that had enslaved people, that it was getting ready to be plowed over by a developer who was just getting ready to put a driveway through just for convenience sake. It's not like it was a necessity. It wasn't like he could have skirted around it, but it was the easiest thing to do. So he was truly alarmed and he called us and said, um, I know that you two have been stewards of a historic African cemetery and can you offer some advice on what I can do to stop this? And Elaine, if not for the grace of just everyday people stumbling, it sounds like, you know, across some of this, it would otherwise be lost. Yes, most definitely. And uh, so uh, our message to everyone is to speak up. I mean, you know, if you buy a property and you see there is a grave there and you don't know what it is or who it belongs to or whatever, speak up because uh, it very well might be an enslaved person or a Native American person that really uh, deserves uh, dignity in death. Such important work. And that book is If These Stones Could Talk. Elaine Buck, Beverly Mills, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate it. And that does it for us, but be sure to check out Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz live on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel at 10 a.m. Friday morning. He's talking legal weed with Senator Vin Gopal, what legislative fixes are still needed in the law. Then he chats with a panel of veteran reporters about this week's big stories. Be sure to subscribe to the channel so you never miss a show. In the meantime, head over to njspotlightnews.org or any of our digital platforms to continue following our reporting. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire news team. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association.